Welcome back to The Debrief. It's uh, not the last episode, but honestly, it kind of feels like it was really the last World Cup if we're being real about it. Yeah, we're talking about Jakarta, the lead in Speed World Cup that happened just this past weekend. As always, I'm Tyler Norton from Plastic Weekly, and joining me to uh, talk about all the, the big ups and downs on the World Cup season is, of course, John Bergman, uh, writes for Climbing Magazine and also for a Climbing Business Journal, and of course, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing, which you should buy right now at the link below you get somebody for christmas uh if not just buying it for yourself um john uh it's been a i don't know if it's been a long season or if it's just been the first real season in the last couple years and it's felt like a bit of an endurance race honestly feel like i'm kind of crawling across the line did you feel about the same I did, and it's good to hear that I wasn't the only one, and I don't want to say that, and I don't mean to detract from some of the performances. We got great stuff throughout the whole season. It had some real jaw-dropping moments, highlight reel moments, but it just feels like it's gone on forever, right? Like mid-April to now, mid-September, mid-late September, I, I kind of think maybe it should have stopped around the time of the European Championships or maybe, I don't know, early August or something. It just feels like we're kind of plodding along a little bit here. I think the competitors are kind of feeling that too, as we will as we will get into. But Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting because it's like, I'm, I'm not sure what the cause or the effect is, but like normally World Cup seasons sometimes go into October, if not, you know, in the past, they'd go into November and December. But I think this one was kind of tough because it does feel like this is the one that everybody's taking off because it's a little too far. The season, especially if you're you're looking for those gold medals in lead, the season was already, frankly, locked up in, in some regards. Uh, and of course, there's this special... World Cup, we're calling it this combined World Cup, combined version 4.0 or whatever. I don't know how many versions of combined we've gone through as a sport in the last like 30 years. Uh, but we've got this special event that's a, a you know, another warm up to an Olympic qualifying year. And that seems to be a lot of athletes priority, frankly. And so I think part of my fatigue was having to get psyched up for a World Cup when it doesn't seem like a lot of the scene was as psyched up. Um, and uh, and we'll talk more about that. But uh, let's let's let's. Let's talk about some some big stuff, what, what really came from all this, and we'll start with headlines as always. And I wanted to, to toss it to you first. Um, what was what was the what kind of felt like the big storyline this week? The headline for me is that Jakarta delivers a banger of a World Cup from top to bottom, start to finish. Great stuff. Jakarta delivers this banger of a World Cup, and yet it's not enough to save this feeling, at least to me, maybe you will talk about it, to save this feeling that the season ended on kind of a whimper. And I guess we can break that down a little bit. First of all, let's talk about aspects that made this Jakarta event such a banger of a World Cup. And I'll to show how, how memorable this was, I'll, I'll even try to riff on some of these without glancing at my notes, because I just feel like there were so many great moments that are kind of burned into my into my mind. First of all, you had awesome stuff with um, Kiramal and we'll, we'll start with speed. Kiramal and Vedrik had that awesome race in the finals where they were separated by point zero zero seven seconds or something like oh, yeah. that. Oh, Kier- yeah, and Aspar, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Kiermau but... gets, yeah. gets the win, and then I think it was the next race for Kiermau. He's going against Long Cow, and Long Cow is, is actually winning, and then he misses the buzzer. That's great drama. And then in the big final, Kiermau's in it. He's going against Aspar Aspar, and Kiermau is actually on world record pace by all accounts and some great analysis there from our friend Josh over at Speed Climbing. That it seems like he was on, Kiermau was on world record pace, and then he slipped. So that's great drama there, too. Of course, then, in the women's division for Speed, you had Lee Juan Dang, who notches third gold medal of the season, right? And so I think that that probably, those three gold medals have given her some incredible confidence. If, if I am... Alexandra Miroslaw and I'm watching that I'm thinking okay like this is this is who's really coming for for me or coming for these gold medals when the next time I'm in a competition so great stuff there and then of course let's switch over to lead it was a banger because Yanya 
earns another gold medal, her 23rd in the lead discipline. And that kind of creates just a nice cyclical bookend to the season, right? Because, of course, she starts the season, the lead season, with wins at, at Innsbruck and Villar and Chamonix and et cetera, et cetera. Closes the season here with another gold. So all of that, that's a long-winded way of annotating some of those aspects that made it the banger. But then when you kind of see how it concluded the season on the whole, look at how many big names were absent, or if not big names, names of people that have done big things this season, right? Of course, I think the lack of Jakob and the absence of Adam Andra and the absence of Alexander Magos, I think those were shouted out by Matt Groom on commentary. None of those men were there. But also, let's run a glance at who I who I wrote down. There was, in addition to those three, there was no Colin Duffy, no Yannick Flohe, no Mejdi Schalk, no Sasha Lehman, no Paul Jemft, no Sam Avazu, all of them. <laughs> where, where we should... <laughs> oh, well, I was just going to say, you're really had... digging into the bucket of like big names that were missing, but yeah, sure, they've well, been in a I mean. finals. Maybe not big names, but they've yeah. done big things. Those are finalists mm-hmm. for, this, for this year, and they weren't there. It almost reminded me of 2020 Briançon, that one-off right. World Cup during the pandemic that where there were so many big names absent. It was kind of hard to analyze it. Of course, then, in the women's division, no Brooke Rabitude, no Natalia Grossman, perhaps most notable of all, no I, Mori. We were saying in the last debrief that we need this trilogy. We, we need to see Yanya go against I, Mori here to close out the season to see what's what to see if Yanya can come back and beat I or if I can beat Yanya for a third time in a row there was just so much of a great narrative that was built there and it didn't happen it kind of feels a little bit like a like an anticlimactic close to the whole season so that's that's my headline banger of a world cup but the season was just kind of like a, a womp womp and it's, it's interesting because my headline is basically the same, but slightly reversed in that it was kind of uh, 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 so much could have gone wrong in Jakarta. I was really nervous about this World Cup one because it's tacked on right at the end of the season. It's out on its own. So you're not traveling to Jakarta with another stop nearby or something like that. It was really a solitary World Cup at the end of a long season. Uh, so I was worried about attendance, which for the most part came true, as you just mentioned. There's a lot of people not there. Uh, but I was also just worried about it being the first time that this federation had held a World Cup and the first time that there was a World Cup in Southeast Asia since like 2006 when Singapore did one, Kuala Lumpur did one. And and there was a lot, I, I don't want to say a lot at stake. Like, I, I don't really know what's going on behind the scenes, but it's hard to run a World Cup. And these guys were putting it on the line. They wanted to showcase their best talent. And in a lot of ways, I felt like it really paid off and it was a huge win for Indonesia. If not, you know, the ultimate boss battle finale to the 2022 season, it was still an excellent World Cup. And particularly in the interest of, of Indonesia was, yeah, they did get to showcase their speed talent um, on home soil. They're, you know... People, Matt Groom kept mentioning the possibility that the the president of Indonesia was was in the crowd. It doesn't really matter. Hopefully, this raised the level of exposure for those athletes who are, frankly, Olympic gold medal not just contenders, but honestly, you kind of want to say Olympic gold medal favorites at the moment. Um, Indonesia's Olympic history is entirely reliant on badminton and uh, uh, weightlifting, I think it is. Like literally for the last two or three decades, that's where they win their medals is just in those two sports. And all of a sudden, there's a brand new sport in the Olympic uh, in the Olympic program and Indonesia is sitting pretty with the favorites in the, in the men's field for sure, but they obviously have huge depth in the women's field too. There's a possibility that they develop someone to become a favorite, uh, although not there just yet. Um, this was an excellent showcase for their speed climbing. And the cherry on top, holy shit, was that they get a rookie who's never been in a World Cup before. He's been in a continental youth event five years ago, six years ago. And, and Raviandi Ramadan gets to a lead finals. And all of a sudden, the crowd is a reason to be there for lead finals and cheer on a home favorite, if not just the big celebrities like Yanya. Um, I don't know how this could have gone better in terms of the climbing for Indonesia. 
Uh, this was everything they could have hoped for and more. It's not reasonable to ask that you get a rookie in a men's lead finals in the first go, even if the field is incredibly diminished. Um, so I think this was a huge win for Indonesia. Maybe not as satisfying for spectators missing out on those, like I said, those boss battles that we really wanted to close it all out. Hopefully we'll get that in Morioka. Uh, uh, yeah, Morioka. Morioki? Morioka? Um, in, uh, in a month's time. Uh, but I think my, the headline for me was... This was a risk to take it to Southeast Asia, but it's something we needed to do. It's something we needed to try. Indonesia wanted to host this in Bali. It didn't work out. They moved it to Jakarta. They made it work, and I thought it went excellent. So congratulations to them. They'll be back next season with a speed event, albeit in the rainy season. So I'm very interested to see how it turns out when they have a genuine 50-50 shot at having an event rained out. Really hope they consider an indoor venue for that one. Um, but yeah, I, I think it was a huge, uh, uh, you know, a, a huge beachhead for uh, for climbing in Southeast Asia, and it doesn't benefit just Indonesia. Just that entire region now has a, a new place to uh, to showcase their talent. So that was my headline. Well, I think all of that just kind of reiterates the first part of my headline. I think we're in total agreement there, in that this this World Cup in Jakarta was fantastic. Like you said better than you could possibly hope it was a big risk they pulled it off i think they showcased some new potential stars i mean the ramadan brothers we saw them in that little segment that the ifsc produced they they have great charisma i'm excited to see what happens with them in forthcoming world cups what about what, what do you speak to regarding the second half of my headline because we agree like i said in that first part of the headline banger of a world cup but mm-hmm. what about that part I said about the, I don't know if it was enough to save this season from just feeling, and and I don't want to say that this season was bad because the season no was great. is it, it's, it's, is it's, it fair it's, to say you were like lacking closure? Is that not not to not to get very like psychological on you? But is that kind of what you were feeling? I think to an extent, and I'm kind of breaking my own rule here, which is what, what we have said so many times which is you don't judge a competition by who is not there you judge mm-hmm. it by who is there right and yet at a point you have so many people that are not there like i said kind of like that brienne song 2020 comp where it's like well you can't help but look at that those absences as part of the story right and you can't talk about the results and the winners without talking about those absences and- okay you know what this is a perfect segue into my winner so we're going to keep the same through line but i'm going to transition to my winner which was i mori um and this is half a troll of the people in the comments who think that i don't respect i mori or something because in the last couple episodes we spent more time talking about yanya and the implications of the yanya i duel uh, for Yanya more so because she is the one with with a, a long history and pedigree. So in my opinion, that's where the story, the heart of the story is. Um, and my winner is Aimori because she wasn't there and her absence was treated on the same level as people like, you mentioned, Adam Andra or Jakob Schubert or Yanya Garnbrett. And those names are people that have wagon loads of World Cup medals. They've got multiple world championships, if not multiple World Cup season championships, and literally decades worth of being like top five competitors. Like Jakob Schubert doesn't miss a world championship podium for like the last 10 years. The guy's crazy. Same thing with Adam Andra. When he shows up, he's basically the favorite, regardless of what the discipline is. Um, and then Yanni Garnbrett in contention for being the greatest of all time. And it's looking like she's showing no signs of stopping. And all of, and I was going to say, the other, the other person that people ask why they're not there is like Alex Honnold, right? Like, is Alex Honnold going to be competing today? Um, I Mori was right up there. She was one of the names that was bothered, you know, to be mentioned uh, at the start of the lead comp uh, as if she was competition royalty. And she doesn't have that pedigree, but because of the spark that we saw in 2019, winning a couple bronze medals in her rookie year, along with Chayun and, and Natsuki Tani and, uh, and uh, Yutang, uh, Yutong Zhang, uh, she comes back after a long absence and, and blows us all away in just two events. She's competed in two World Cups in three years. And that has been enough because of the weight of of Yanya as the, the hurdle that Aimori has to clear. That is enough for her to become a huge absence when she's not at a single World Cup. And that is astronomically huge uh, for, for the storylines. Like Yanya is still... 
this is we're still living in I was gonna, we're still living in Yanya Garnbrett's world, right? Uh, this is the Yanya Garnbrett era for both bouldering and lead climbing in 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 the women's uh, in, in the women's side of things. And all of a sudden, we have a name. Natalia Grossman was impressive. It was cool to see a challenger, and and she did a great job this season with Yanya not there, but. Aimori is that new person, just like Chayun was a couple years ago. Uh, and that's a really big deal. So my winner was Aimori because even in her absence, she was kind of the dominant name mentioned in chat. And Yanya Garnbrett's win felt a little bit more hollow because the ultimate challenger wasn't there this time. I think that what you said about her being the ultimate challenger is that's the key. Because if if Aimori had s- sort of swooped in just for the the Coper World Cup and won that and then left. I think, I mean, obviously we would have been impressed, but it would have just, we would have been like, okay, like how do we take this? We don't, I don't know. It wouldn't have resonated as much perhaps, but the fact that she won in Coper and then she wins in Edinburgh again, like beating Yanya, right? Yeah. I'll I'll put these, I'll put the, I'll put the quotes in for that one. Like proving that one of those wins, I mean, you don't want to call any win a, a fluke, so to speak, especially when no. it does entail win beating someone like Yanya. But like, but, but having two in a row like that proves, I mean, that consistency just proves how truly great Imori is, I think. Yeah, I don't like it doesn't, I, I just want to be clear, like I, as much as I think Imori clearly won both events, nobody is arguing with that kind of thing. I'm not, not talking about fraud or anything like that i wish the separation was bigger like in my opinion she won both and her and yanyak were clearly at the same level if not i being a little bit higher but my only complaint was that i wish i got to see more separation from the root setting right so yeah um it and frankly tying with yanyi garmbrett two events in a row is a huge indication of your level two right so sure yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not uh, arguing i i would have loved and I was thinking about this as it was happening, that upper section of the women's final route with those, whatever you want to call them, thumb crimps, thunder cling, those, which Yanya ended up not really doing as much thumb stuff as she kind of palmed them a little bit, which was r- smart on her part. But the fact that that section and those holds did stymie Cheon So, Cheon So popped off there, I was thinking, Oh my goodness! Like, how would I, Mori, have done on those? I want to see it. I want, I want somebody to go to Japan and just like <laughs> set up that one sequence of those thumb holds just on like a bouldering wall. And like, let's see, I okay, let's see, let's see how you would tackle this. Well, I was gonna say the Chamonix wall is now apparently for hire and touring. So all we need is is a is a wealthy climbing patron to ship this thing up to Japan. Uh, don't even take the holds off. Yeah. That'd be amazing. Let's get a GoFundMe for yeah. Plastic Weekly to acquire <laughs> that Chamonix wall and and put it in the Plastic Weekly warehouse. Yikes. Um, I, I guess going back to what you said about this lack of closure, and especially when we're talking about wanting this trilogy, you know what it felt like to me? It felt like, if imagine there's a movie, a, a, tr- a trilogy of movies where you have... Like the main character is played by this iconic movie star or whatever for like the first two movies of the trilogy. <laughs> and then for that last movie, for whatever, contract dispute or something, the, the marquee star, one of the big movie stars is like, yeah, I'm not going to come back for this movie. How do you take that then? You go to see the movie and you're kind of like, eh, I don't know. Like it was fine, but it could have been a lot better if that movie star had been there, you know? Um and that's to take nothing away from Yanya's victory. It was it was great. She earned it. She had a phenomenal season. But eh, I don't know. I I just can't shake this feeling that the season kind of ended on a, on a unsatisfactory note. Well, according to the IFSC, the season's not over. Apparently, there's still still a World Cup in a discipline that's never existed before and never will exist again. So just hold your horses. Yeah. Hopefully, in my recap, I was kind of like, "Yeah, this this is the season's over." Well, it's yeah. kind of not over, but it sort of is over. It's confusing. Yeah. Let's uh let's take the opportunity just to look at the actual season uh, podiums. Um, one thing to note was for for the women's side of lead, Yanya already had her uh, her win locked in. Well, let uh, me. Let Go me ahead. interrupt here. Let me give my winners yeah. because this is a good. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, this yeah. is a good segue to this. Sure. Uh, I, I split my winners for reasons that I will explain. I I chose equally 
Luca Podicar and Al Yurakuza because okay. I think that they are kind of like not reflective versions of each other performatively, but maybe ref- refractive versions. And here's what I mean. If you look at this competition on the whole, um, Al Yurakuza, I mean, he wins the gold medal, right? A fantastic competition for him in Jakarta. When you pan out to the overall season rankings, though, he's he's he ends up finishing in fourth place. So he's not really in contention too much for those top for the top spot or even the top three spots. If you look at the numbers, those top three guys were like three thousand eight hundred something, and and Al Yurakuza is like three thousand two hundred. So right. it's a it's a pretty big jump from third to fourth place. Obviously, fourth place is still fantastic, mm-hmm. but you know what I mean. He had an awesome Jakarta World Cup in the overall rankings, eh, fourth place. And then you look at Luka Podokar, who at this competition, eh, he made the finals. Like all, uh, Big applause to him for that, but he ends up in seventh place. He's not really vying for that podium spot or certainly not vying for that gold medal at this particular Jakarta event. And yet, for the season on the whole, he ends up taking it all winning the lead men's uh, championship. So that's why I say that I, you kind of have to choose both Al and Luca, but it, it, for different reasons. Yeah, sure. I, the, you know, I, I guess uh, Luca fell slightly below, like what I guess I think of as the crux section on the finals climb. So I guess that's like fair enough. Um, although I, yeah, actually men's, that might, that might be a theme we should have discussed is kind of how there was like a little bit of element of maybe some cruxiness to, to some of the climbs. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it's interesting because both of them have been fairly consistent in their attendance. Um, it's been an interesting year because, uh, there's been a lot of names we haven't seen. The first one obviously is, is Adam Andra who kind of bailed on the year. Jakob Schubert bailed on the second half. People like Alberto Hines have been like a little bit inconsistent. People like Sasha Lehman, who might have been a favorite for this season, didn't perform as well across the season as I might have like expected. I kind of start to think he would become one of the favorites. Um, this season's been fascinating because what there were seven World Cups, and six of them were won by people who before this year have never won a World Cup before, uh, which is a statistical anomaly that's never happened percentage-wise or in real numbers since the first year of World Cups when technically everyone was a first-time World Cup winner, right? Uh, It was an interesting year for all of these kind of like First time winners to to come up and show their proof that Al Yurakusa, Luca Potichar, Jesse Gruper, trying to think of who else I'm I'm missing, Taisei Hama, um, and one more who I'm blanking on, I guess. No, no big deal. Um yeah, I thought I thought just kind of it was a it was a fun season for the men in terms of getting to see this new talent and seeing a lot of them being consistent, right? For me, the Taisei Jesse Grouper storyline was one I was really hoping for after the first half. Uh, but there was a bunch of names in that in that uh, cast of characters, and Luca Potichar came out on top after just being consistent through the year, right? Um, I don't know. I think the men's field for me was satisfying given we didn't have a, a dominant storyline or a, a consistent representation of like legendary climbers, right? Um, and I guess I was kind of hoping for that after last year, where Stefano Gisolfi, who is is a veteran climber uh, and uh, and has had a lot of World Cup success before, but his victory last year was, in, in my opinion, partially because the field was a bit diminished because of the, the Olympics messing with everybody's schedule. And I kind of hope this year we would see a bit more of, of the big names coming back, duking it out. You know, Jakob and Andra maybe in their sunset years with Stefano Gisolfi off of a off of a win, really like vying for those last couple World Cup medals of their career. But instead, it was a, a year of rookies, which which uh, I'll take, and and maybe was a bit of a nice contrast to compare to uh, the women's field, as it often is being dominated by one or two people. Um, so I don't know. It was something different, not as not as easy to build storylines around, which is honestly what I'm all about. But it was uh, it was nice to see new faces, and I hope uh, I hope there's some consistency next year where we see those guys come back and be at an even better level uh, and know who it is that's going to be competing for the medals rather than first timers every single event. Some of that extends to the bouldering season as well. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily rookies winning, but you, let's remember we did have. I think a different boulder event won by a different man. Yeah. I don't think anybody repeated this year, if I remember right. right. And so 
that that lack of consistency, lack of a, a big name staying at the top repeatedly, it, it started even before this lead season started. It kind of mm-hmm. you could argue it started in the Boulder season this year. Yeah. Um, and and that's been something we've discussed previously as well is how there there, there doesn't seem to be that that stable force in the men's division like there is in the women's division. I don't know. I don't think you can say like Yanya because Yanya is a once in a lifetime. You can't expect to have somebody that's doing comparable things to Yanya necessarily, but there, but even, yeah, there, it just isn't. I mean, we kind of thought maybe it would be Jesse Grouper. He notched two wins. Um, but I, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's with it, it's not necessarily a bad thing either. It's just a different dynamic. No, it's perfect, you know, because half of people watching this think Yanya Garnbread is boring because she wins every World Cup. And for those people, the men's field is for you because you have no idea what's going to happen and the climbing is really good. But if you like storylines like I do and, and uh, the history is kind of what, what motivates you to see who wins, then the women's field is, is kind of my paradise, basically. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this. I do think that consistency drives fan interest to an extent Mm -hmm. i mean you look at when was the time in the recent past that the fans were most i would argue most rabid or most invested other than the olympic pathway it was when yanya was going for the sweep in 2019 Mm -hmm. right and i think before the couple years before that maybe in 2013 it was when anna store was going for the sweep to to try to sweep the season ultimately foiled by uh, eula verm but but and then you can go back to Francois Legrand in the 1990s and whatnot. It's just, yeah, when you have somebody that starts to build uh, multiple wins and kind of stacks this sandwich of victories throughout the season, that gets people invested in it. And we're, yeah. we didn't really see that much in the men's division. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to talk about my losers um, because it, it's it's kind of a, a a flip of of something that you described as your winners. My losers is the Chinese speed team, and they came away with medals. Like they came away with the gold in women's, and they came away with the bronze in men's. But this is a speed comp that if you if you didn't watch it, you should watch this one. Um, and as much as this is supposed to be my losers category, the reason I'm saying this is because this was kind of like my dream speed comp where there was a lot of drama, but it was at the top of the wall, right? Rather than constant false starts, people having weird slips at the bottom, somehow this event was just full of these acts of God that almost invariably helped the Indonesian team. I was, it was incredible seeing these last minute falls, one person falls, then the other person slips or misses the buzzer, uh, like in Long Cow's uh, our race that dropped him down in the bronze medal race. Um, I urge people to watch this speed final because it is, if, if you want, you can skip the round of 16, like the, the eighth finals or whatever. But after that, it is a fire speed competition and the Chinese team came so close to having, you know, two Chinese men in the gold medal race rather than the bronze. Like it could have been a Chinese podium sweep rather than an Indonesian uh, dominant victory on the men's side with just like, you know, with just the flap of a butterfly's wings. It was really incredible. Did you enjoy yourself watching the speed this time around? Because I like... I feel like commentary is always a little bit breathless when it comes to speed climbing and it runs so fast that you you don't really have anything intelligible to say. So you just kind of have to act shocked all the time. Like, what an incredible race. Yeah. Uh, but this one was a this one was there was reason to be breathless. It was so much fun to watch. Yeah. Let me look at my notes here for what I wrote down, because I did jot down a number of big speed moments that um, I just put a big star by it because. It yeah. Was, I mean, like I said, you had that fast race between Vedrick and Kiramau, which was in the one-fourth final. Which is uh, so disappointing that they had to meet in the quarterfinals, right? You know, like you want those guys a little bit later on, but yeah. Yeah, you had in the women's one-eighth final, Yu Fang Ji's win was ultimately the result of her, her opponent leading and then having this really costly right foot slip. And they were saying that that was a big upset on commentary. Um, you had a, a, another woman uh, in that same round um, slip when, when jumping for the buzzer. And then, of course, you had, like you said, long cows m- missing of the buzzer. It was mm-hmm. great. I think I, arguably the best speed final or, or speed comp of the whole season, probably. It was mm-hmm. great. And it, and it, it's interesting that I think you make a good point about China being team China being the loser for this competition. Whereas I think if we're looking at the season on the whole, the speed season, China 
is Team China's probably among the winners because they really have kind of surged back with a lot of athletes that are top tier athletes that are vying for those podium spots. Whereas it wasn't that long ago, a year, two years ago, that we, that it was Yiling Song, and that was kind of it. She was sort of out there on her own doing this thing. Now, obviously, anybody that looks at the records knows that China used to be a powerhouse in speed years and years ago, but there was a little bit of a drought there for whatever reason other than Yiling. And, and now they're, I mean, Team China's just come back in a really big way. And if, there, if we had a category for breakout team of the year in the Plastic Weekly Awards, they would probably be the, be the ones that you would put right up there. Um, the one thing that's satisfying for me is last year was a real bummer seeing Kiramal and, and Vedrick do so well in those two speed events. But in order to actually have a speed season or any discipline season, you need at least three World Cups to to be able to say you like won the World Cup season, the overall or whatever like ridiculous term we have for it. To be the World Cup champion, you need at least three events to run. And they didn't get that last year when they were these breakout stars, unbelievably dominant, just tore the record to pieces. So I'm really glad that this year they managed to hold on to that and frankly looked like, you know, unchallengeable, at least in that final event. It didn't really matter how well they did. Uh, uh, Vedrik and Kiramal were basically guaranteed for a one, two in, in some, uh, in some order. Um, and, uh, so as much as, yeah, China is the breakout, I'm, I'm extremely happy that there's a little bit of satisfaction that they get those those trophies uh, for the season because they deserved it last year and they just couldn't get it. The speed thing is interesting to me, uh, seeing um, uh, Alexandra Kaluchka come away with a season win when it's so fascinating because th the the speed season was dominated by two particular people and it was Alexandra Mirasal at the start, Li Juanzang at the end. Alexandra won that single event, um, but it's it's one of those, those you know, fluke, uh, fluke's a ridiculous word. It's just one of those instances where you had these incredible athletes dominate and then say, you know, I'm not going to do any more this season. I'm going to focus on European championships or I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take care of my own life. Uh, not really sure why, why the Chinese team decided to debut later this year. Um, but when they did arrive, they were incredibly dominant or, or at least, you know, top tier contenders. And so yeah, Alexandra kind of just through that sheer consistency managed to get herself that top spot. And of course, Emma Hunt and, uh, and, uh, Natalia as well, finishing out that, uh, that women's podium, if I remember right. Um, but yeah, it was just an interesting podium because like we said at the top, uh, of the year, we were talking about Alexandra Miroslaw winning maybe four in a row, which would have been a, a really kind of historic thing, put her in strong contention for, for one of the greats, uh, uh, speed climbers of, of history, uh, and then kind of just like walk away from it. I remember at Salt Lake City, you and I, we were there and we were chasing down Alexandra Miroslaw trying to get an interview mm -hmm. because we were pretty convinced that she was going to be the big story for the season, right? Yeah. You were kind of like, she's going to do great things. We want to get an interview interview with her now. And here we are at Jakarta to close the season. And she's, I mean, she's not even in the forefront, meaning Alexander Miroslav isn't yeah. really even in the forefront of your mind because no. she's just been absent. And that's fine if she chose to do that. But we've managed to have so many other special moments since her, her hiatus or her departure or whatever you want to say from the World Cups. That, yeah, you just kind of forget, which sets up a great, really intriguing 2023 season. Hopefully, Alexandra Miroslav will choose to do more of the World Cups. You never know, right? Her focus might be solely on Olympic qualification, and that's it. I, only she she knows what her plans are for this forthcoming World Cup season. But, that's got to be the focus, man. That's going to be the hardest medal in, in the history of climbing to win is going to be that first Olympic speed medal. Like every speed medal is hard fought and your preparation is half of it and luck is the other. And holy shit, yeah, an Olympic speed medal. There's there's like a decade backup of, of strong climbers who want that thing to cap their career. Plus all of the up and comers. It's going to be wild. I, but I she'll have the Olympic experience, right? She'll be yeah, able to sure. it, theoretically maybe have the nerves calmed a little bit more than somebody that is a first time Olympian in 2024. So it, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. And, and the 2023 season, I think as much as 
there is going to be weirdness with the Olympic qualification and all that. It's kind of like, here we go again with this, right? I'm sure we're going to have people dropping off of the World Cup circuit to do Olympic qualification stuff and to focus on that. So I don't, I think this season was weird, 2022. I think 2023 will probably be even weirder. Yep. But it'll be exciting. Yeah, I think we'll see. I think we'll see more of the big names, just less consistency from them. Like Adam will be back; he'll do some events, um, but uh, it'll all be about the World Championships next year for sure, which uh, which will be an event to uh, see, if not attend in person for sure. That's going to be a, an incredible uh, event in Switzerland. Um, yeah, I wanted to hear what your uh, what your loser was because I guess I, I just did mine. Yeah, let's circle back. I feel like we're ringing yeah. the bell loud, but I I would say Team Japan. Because of the I Mori thing, the, mm. and obviously you could you could also argue Team Japan was a big winner because of how well their athletes did and sure. whatnot, sending so many into the finals. But I'm putting Team Japan in the loser category because, by all accounts, from what we heard from Matt Groom on commentary, it was their choice, Team Japan's choice, not to send I Mori to this event. And so if we're frustrated that we were robbed of the trilogy, all that stuff, then the culprit, the, the person that you know, deserves the blame apparently is Team Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'd love to talk to somebody from that team, the, the organization, and, and listen to what the, the thinking was behind that because it'd be one thing if I, Mori was 16 years old or something, if she was in the case of, uh, say, like an Orion Bertone, right, or even like a, a youthful Yanya Garnbret from back in the day where you you have this big decision, do we send her to the full World Cups, do we not send her? Okay, then it, then it makes a little sense. Maybe you don't want to send her to this World Cup. But that breaks down, that logic breaks down for a couple reasons. First of all, it's not like I, Maury did a full season at all so it's not like there's this worry about burnout or anything like that also she's not 16 she's she just turned 19 actually so happy birthday to, to, mm-hmm. to i'm Ori. she was 18 when she won those events uh recently but she just turned 19 in mid-september so she's you know not 16 and also jakarta to tokyo that flight it's not like the jet lag and the track it's not like you're flying from japan to the U.S. to the Utah, the Salt Lake City World Cup or anything like that. No, it's a it's a flight. J- Tokyo to Jakarta, I think, is like seven hours if I remember correctly. So it's 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 lengthy, but it's still you would think it's easily doable. First, yeah, I think I'm I'm torn because I I I do certainly feel like it it was our loss that she wasn't there. But I guess for, from what I understand, and every organization is different. First of all, what is the theme of the year for your team, right? And 2022 is kind of a relief year. Uh, normally it wouldn't have been, but because the Olympics were last year, you're going to say, okay, all of our headliners, this year is not too important. Chill out. Take a chance to just enjoy yourselves. Rest, recuperate. You're probably going to be a headliner in 2024. So this is your opportunity to take a bit of a year off, okay? So that's kind of the, the mood for 2022 this year is part taking some time off for your headliners and part development for your up-and-comers. Now, I think the other portion is, for the most part, they're planning who goes to these World Cups in advance, probably by months. I know in Canada, if I remember right, they kind of decide the first half of the season very early on, and then they revisit later to determine who's going to go for the second half of the season. Canada's got some other issues in terms of like funding, possibly, so it's not like we're sending a full roster every time, necessarily. Um, but for Japan, I think they did send a full roster. I think if I'm doing the math right, the six women that they sent to lead, that is their max for this event. Um, and I guess it like, imagine coming into the start of the season and I am where he tells you world cups are not my priority. Getting into university, starting university is my priority. So she's not going to be in contention for, for winning a season. She's already proven herself to be a strong climber at domestic events. And in 2019 with some, with some big showings. And if you say, okay, this athlete is not their priority this time around. If there's a couple events you want to go to, we'll try and slot you in, but the cl- one of the closest and easiest lead World Cups to get to for them this year was Jakarta. And so that's the perfect event to send your dev squad, right? In your developmental year, 
you might as well make this where you send the you know the up and comers and and whoever else feels like uh, like showing up. So I I think it makes complete sense to me because it was a decision made probably before um, Imori attended Coper and ended up winning. So I get it. Um, it's still a loss that she wasn't there, but I think it's just you know it's the 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 planning for the season really didn't take into account her wins because it was almost certainly a decision made before that. Um, but yeah, I think that's so fascinating how all the teams kind of make all their decisions differently. You know, it, it goes to, to, uh, to seeing the absence of, of Tomoa, um, in the lead season this year, although, you know, for sure, he's somebody that's really focused on combined and, and wants to prove himself as a lead climber going into Paris. Um, yeah, I think, I think every country is, is fascinating. And, and I, I guess I just, I don't want to throw shade at the Japanese team because, this was kind of one of those events where you say, even when the Japanese top team isn't there, they still send a busload and every single athlete is in contention for like semifinals, if not finals. So whatever they're doing, they, you know, can't really argue with their, with their strategy because they are kind of the dominant team of our era, frankly. So can't yeah, fault I mean, them. That's, that's why you have to specify when you're saying team Japan in the loser category, it is solely yeah. for their choice yeah. <laughs> to rob us of the entertainment value yeah. of sending Imori. It is not, you could easily make a case that team Japan deserves to be in the, in the winner category because I'm looking, you know, look at the results here. Al Yurakuza, Masahiro Higuchi, um, Hidemasa Nishida, Satoni Nishida, like, oh my gosh, that's the men's final and lead. Um, yeah. And yeah. You know, uh, Ryu Nakagawa and, and Natsuki Tani in the women's division. So I, I, obviously they had a uh, they had a a fantastic showing even without Imori. But mm-hmm. gosh darn it, I wanted to see I wanted to see Imori and Yanya battle it out and didn't get that. It didn't <laughs> happen. Conclude this discussion with the same, the same <laughs> topic that we started. I was going to say, even though we had technically shared our notes ahead of time as to where we were going to go, some of them ended up. Yeah, it worked out great. Since since we're something just touched my keyboard and, and started typing a bunch of characters. It's all fine. I wanted to circle back because as I was preparing for this, I noticed it, you and I would both say that probably when trying to come up with headlines. Uh, nothing stood out or with headlines and topics for this event. It was a little bit more, more, more muted in terms of the, the exceptionalism of storylines. Like it was, it was a bit more level. There was nothing really crazy that happened. It was, it was great that it went well for Indonesia, but you know, there was, uh, it, it wasn't quite like the events where, wow, there's a, there's an upstart climber that all of a sudden came out of nowhere and, and beat the, the dominant climber. So in terms of storylines, it was pretty even, uh, uh, pretty muted, but we still, didn't select anything about the broadcast or the IFSC or the route setting as one of our stories, which is almost always a very good sign. That means that there was nothing that dominated the the conversation um, that was a negative from from the organizers or from the setters or or from the federation. And so I just wanted to ask if you had any uh, any comments about those topics, route setting, broadcast. Nothing about the broadcast stood out to me aside from like it's 2022 and we still can't get a clock to work consistently, but I can't make that my loser every event because uh, otherwise it would be um, and it gets pretty boring. But, you know, there were, weren't a lot of complaints about camera angles. There weren't a lot of complaints about route setting, although, you know, there were many ties in the in the like in the ranks that mattered but there were some cruxy areas on some of the routes i'm just curious if you had any reflections on any of those topics well, regarding the production count me in as as another person that really likes those drone shots of the skyscrapers <laughs> i just thought that was really cool this I, they they said over and over how the venue the Jakar- being in jakarta in kind of the heart of the city was really exciting and and it looked really cool too so i i thought it made for some some great production camera shots and whatnot uh the route setting it's funny that they made such a big deal about the final the men's and women's finals route connecting at the top because it's almost like they touted it so much that something was bound to happen and of course what happened well we don't get a man and none of the men make it into the head wall so we don't really get to see them vying for in, in that combined section i would have liked to see a one of the men make it into the head wall for sure uh but uh, yeah overall i thought the setting was it was yeah it was okay not no big alarms yeah. from me it was kind of funny because i um 
I, I don't feel like they tried to hype it up too much. Like Matt Groom mentioned it, but they filmed that interview with with uh, Julian. I think he was the head setter for this one. Uh, talking about that method and they could have aired that segment before the finals to give everybody a taster but you could tell that they were very cautious like man we don't want to hype this up because you're honestly when you try to do something clever with root setting when you try to be smart when you when you try to think you're you've got a cool idea you're going to get wrecked um, especially when you got the pressure of a world cup and the field is kind of wonky it's really dangerous to try new stuff and, and fortunately this didn't end in in you know a bunch of ties and one gender um and, and a bunch of low falls and another, although the men didn't get as high as we wanted to, uh, could have gone way worse. I'm, I think it's, uh, uh, a tough challenge to set a section for both men and women, especially when it's the section where you ideally want the separation to come from. Um, you run the risk of it being too easy for one and, and too hard for the other. So, um, I think it's a cool concept. I think if it if it works well, that's a really fun extra uh, little tidbit of storyline, a fun little thrill for the audience. But I'm not sure functionally if it's something that uh, that you can consistently do or expect or ask from root setters. But uh, but yeah. So I my biggest takeaway was that they bothered to air the the interview about it afterwards, just in case things didn't go well. That was that was kind of my one uh, takeaway. Yeah. I, I I will say I do like run and jump starts for the men's for, or for, right. for, the, for the lead discipline in general, because there's just such a that, that heart pounding moment whenever any competitor is getting ready to do it. <laughs> we didn't really see anybody bumble that start. And I don't think we have for a while. Right. For a run and jump. We've seen this a few times. M most of them have seemed to just cruise right through them. But. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, at some point, uh, we are going to see heart somebody, rate up. at some point we're going to see somebody kind of fumble one of those run and jump lead starts. And yeah. that will be heartbreaking and exciting at the same time, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I guess what uh, what we're putting it there for is if, if the whole idea is to give you a little bit of a reason to, to tense up and get psyched, there's always a little bit of risk and, and somebody's going to eat shit eventually. And uh, and they just, you know, they got the fuzzy end of the lollipop, unfortunately. Um, let, let me ask you this. Uh, and I know it's kind of weird because the season, like we said, the season's over, but it's not over. But for all intents and purposes, the, the, it is over in the sense of the the overall awards. Yeah, the, the proper World scored, Cup season the, is over. Yeah, the, for yes, sure. Separate disciplines are finished. Uh, how would you, I don't know if we want to do like five stars or out of ten, like how would you rate this 2022 season? That's a great question. Um, I'm, or grade, I'm, if you want to give it like a, a grade. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I would have to take a really long time to do that, but I guess the first thing that comes to mind is like comparing the disciplines um, in terms of of how they felt like this year compared to well maybe not last year is a good comparison but how like how does the lead season this year feel compared to the last couple of years or the the boulder season at the speed season um i think that let's start with the speed season i'm not disappointed by this but a big talking point for the last couple of years ever since freaking La Sportiva decided to name a shoe the 499 everybody's wondering when are they going to break the world record and and there's like that's I'm, I'm kind of I don't really care about that story it'll happen eventually and frankly the longer the anticipation builds that's fine by me right um so some people might feel disappointed that we haven't broken the five second barrier yet but whatever um I I think the speed season's at an interesting point I'm still disappointed that the historically dominant region of Russia is still not involved. And so I, you know, I, I like this, all the stories that involve different regions or different athletes duking it out and one era ending as the other one comes up. And so it feels kind of empty that, that one of those regions is left out because of decisions not made by speed climbers. Um, who knows how strong all those guys are. I hope they're all safe, especially given this, you know, climbers as, as we talked about in the past are, are, paid by the Russian military. And so I'm, I am more worried now than ever that they uh, might be under some level of risk due to the, the mobilization that's been announced. Um, so I'm, I'm disappointed in that regard, but it's, uh, um, it's nice to see just like so much strong talent becoming really dominant. Um, so it's been a good speed season. I've been happy with that. Not as, not as much as I could have wanted it to. Um, I thought the lead season was really good, uh, but again, missing some legends uh, it was disappointing for me. Like, 
lead lead is kind of the legacy discipline in in my opinion it's kind of the old the good old boy of of rock climbing it's the one with all the history it's kind of the most elitist discipline if you kind of want to think of it that way and i really you know the events uh, the big headline events when they don't have the Adamandras and and they don't have all those big legacy names at them feel feel a little less interesting and uh, and honestly the same thing kind of with bouldering even though it's a bit more of the upstart discipline I think I think what I've been feeling the last couple of weeks is like maybe a little bit of discouragement that that the Olympics is doing kind of what we thought it would do. And it's going to kind of throw a wrench in, in all of the events that we really care about. Like world cups start to take a back seat. The world championships will still be great events, but they no longer matter as much as the Olympics. And, and so, you know what you just look at the world championship that happened last year in 2021 and the number of people that decided not to give a shit and not show up to a world championships, which is, is, my opinion should be the ultimate prize in climbing, especially while the Olympic medal is for combined. Like who, like, what does that mean to you from a climbing perspective? It means a lot, obviously in terms of like international prestige and reputation and stuff, uh, reputation and stuff. Um, but I just feel like, yeah, climbing the, as we, we, we achieve the Olympic dream and, and some days it feels like the events that we care about are kind of left a little bit like a husk sometimes not that's maybe a bit dramatic but it does feel like the events that i care about that that i love are are, are less of a priority for the for the athletes and i think that's I've, I've just been feeling that way a little bit more in the last couple uh last couple of months as more and more names have said you know what my season's over um i'm gonna start worrying about 2023 and the only reason they worry about 2023 is because it's the setup for 2024 and you realize that okay great so it is really Olympics or bust. And yeah, I was worried about that before the Olympics and, and now it seems to be coming true. So this was the season to sort of take your foot off the gas a little bit, I think. Mm -hmm. And again, this goes back to COVID kind of wrecking everything because normally we would have had a, a couple of you know, normal seasons in there in between you know, every four years, right? The Olympics. So we would have had, I think, this return to normalcy. But because the Olympics were postponed for a year, this is really the only year that they that an athlete could kind of decompress a little bit and maybe not focus as intensely on competitions if the Olympics are the ultimate goal. Because mm -hmm. obviously, like you said, in 2023, next year, the qualification is going to start. And then in 2024, you have the actual Paris Olympics. So, uh, yeah, this was like the only year that they could maybe rest a little bit or, or kind of pick and choose a little bit what they wanted to do and not do. And... Mm -hmm. And I think we felt that when we looked at the rosters as the season went along. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of my, my big takeaway. But um, I don't know. Did you have any reflections yourself on uh, on the year in general? Yeah, I'd probably have to. I just ask that spontaneously. I haven't really molded over too much myself. I suppose that'd be food for thought as we put together maybe the end of season awards or something like that. Mm -hmm. We could kind of analyze the season as a, on a whole uh, a little more. I don't know if I don't argue with anything you said. I think your logic was pretty good. I I thought the speed season was great. The only things that I think could have made it a little better maybe would be if we had gotten a man breaking or that five second barrier. We were so we've been so close since July, right? Mm -hmm. the, and and since July, it's just kind of been this holding our breath every event. And there's an excitement to that certainly, but it didn't happen. So maybe I'll tick the grade a little bit lower because of that. And like you said, for all the athletes that aren't present, what be it Russian athletes, Ukraine athletes and all of that, uh, I, I, you want to, you want a robust field. You want the best of the best participating. If some of them aren't there, you got to tick it a little bit lower, but it was great speed season overall boulder season. I love the boulder season. Maybe there's some national bias in here, but I do feel like this boulder season really was the star making season for Natalia Grossman. Uh, she is one of, if not the biggest uh, climbers in the U S right now. And I think it's all because of, or a lot of, because of that 2000, this 2022 Boulder season. So uh, high marks for me, even though it, there is that, <laughs> that weirdness of Yanya participating and then leaving and the lead season, we've been over it. I, kind of left a little bit to be desired just because the stuff with i mori coming and going and then the stuff with the the men's field diminishing here for the tail end of the season so i'd probably 
maybe tick the men's season a lowest of all in terms of grades or rankings. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you're man. We're living in the in the golden age of the USA. Like who who could have who could have asked for this? It's actually it's kind of cool if we if we ever bother looking back at some of the debriefs that we recorded in like 2019, where it was just pure delight that Brooke Rabatou and and Nathaniel and then Kyra and Colin managed to qualify. Like wow, you guys are sending four athletes. It's amazing. And then you know two years later, all of a sudden this explosion from from team usa it's been really cool to kind of um uh be recording these as that evolution happened that kind of like big bang of u.s talent yeah it's a, it, it's a double-edged sword right because you get used to that then you get used yeah. to that that wealth of, of riches and then for these events like edinburgh and here in jakarta when the u.s team maybe doesn't send a full squad or maybe the u.s doesn't field very many or field any competitors into the final round you're kind of like what the heck what's going on but it wasn't that long ago when yeah that was the norm to not Mm -hmm. see any americans in the in these finals yeah yeah well i think we should probably wrap it there if you if you uh, don't have any other uh, honorable mentions um yeah, I just I was just gonna do a, a build up for for the combined event in October. Uh, we'll be back with one more regular debrief in October. If you're still watching though, because not many people get this far in the show, um, thanks of course for watching. John and I are gonna do a Q and A Q&A episode slash you suggest the topic episode. Um, we're gonna do that after the combined event in October, so it's probably gonna be recorded in November, but. In the comments, if you do want to leave anything where you'd like to hear uh, what we think about something or just want to ask a question about climbing or about John's reportage or, or about the, you know, the, the stats and stuff, um, feel free to start asking them now. We'll, we'll keep track of them and we'll do an episode in November that you guys can get involved in. Um, other than that, we're going to Japan at the end of October. We'll have some guests for that one and we'll kind of wrap up the year with, uh, uh, with a new format which again will last for probably two years and then we'll never see again. So enjoy it while it lasts. But anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, If you enjoyed it, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. You can support the podcast on Patreon in the link below. And of course you can join our Discord to watch comps live with us uh, and chat about it through the rest of the year. Otherwise, thank you again for watching. John, thanks as always. And we'll see y'all in the next one.